I'm looking our first speaker. She is still not, not uh, present, but we cut a, we have a pre-recorded paper. So we can uh, uh, start through. Um, the first speaker is uh, Leah Lothorpe, assistant professor at University of Oregon, uh, United States. And her paper is uh, on subversive narrative, colonial and post-colonial legend telling in Kerala, India. And I hope uh, she will drop in during the, uh, her paper. I have to share it. So this should be uh, just a second. I have to. Um, ah, yeah, I have to try again for me to clip optimieren. Hello, everyone. I'm delighted to be part of this fabulous panel. So everybody can hear her? Yes. Fine. And I'd like to thank the organizers, Dr. Groschwitz and Janicek, for organizing this. Um, the title of my talk today is Subversive Narrative, Colonial and Post-Colonial Legend Telling in Kerala, India. And this is based on over two years of ethnographic fieldwork with the Kudiyattam Sanskrit Theatre Community in southwestern India in the state of Kerala. I'm sitting in the afternoon shade with Suraj Nambiar, who we see here in the picture, a young non-hereditary Kudiyattam actor and instructor who has performed all over India and the world. Suraj is quiet and thoughtful with a talent for words and metaphor. When I ask him about legends of Kudiyattam hereditary actors or Chakyars of yore, he tells me that he loved to listen to the stories that his guru, Amunar Madhavachakya used to tell and launches into his own storytelling session. In this family, there was Amunar Parameshwarachakya. At that time, there were three native kingdoms in Kerala, Travancore, Cochin, and Malabar. There was a king who loved Kathakali dance drama and had artists on staff. He called Parameshwarachakya there to teach one of his Kathakali artists, Ishwara Pillai Vijaripukha, who was a bookkeeper. It's a big position. He was a great Kathakali artist, and this Chakyar was called there to teach him. When Chakyar was staying there, he used to go to the beach in the evenings to wander. At that time, British rule was going on, and a British official was there with his wife, walking his dog on the beach. When this dog saw people, it would bark and go over to them. He didn't bite, but he would frighten them. So he was barking and frightening people, and this couple was enjoying that. Suraj stopped to chuckle and then continued. This dog went up to the chakyar barking, so he took a stone and threw it, and the dog ran back yelping. The people thought that the chakyar had thrown the stone, but he didn't, he was just acting. Nothing happened to the dog. So the couple went to the king and complained that the chakyar attacked their dog and demanded the king punish him. At that time, you know, they were able to demand that as they were the ones really ruling. So the king sent for the Chakyar and the Englishman said, this is the man. The king asks Chakyar, did you do that? He said, no, I didn't. I was just acting. The king understood he was just acting, but he told him, yes, I understand you were acting, but I cannot make them understand that. So you must do so. The Chakyar turned to them and said, I was just acting. But they said, no, that can't be true because it's a dog. He doesn't know any treatises of theater. How can you make him understand? Suraj paused to laugh again, obviously enjoying the thought of a canine theater connoisseur. Still smiling, he continued. So Chakyar said then, to make you understand, let me do one thing. And Chakyar tightened his cloth into position. With his eyes, he made a mountain and threw it at the man. The man fainted. He fainted. His wife was sitting farther away, so she saw this. When the Englishman got up, he finally understood what acting was. This paper focuses on this legend known as the Englishman and the dog, 
which was first published in early 20th century Kerala in a collection by Kootara Shankuni, known as Aidihya Mala, or Garland of Legends. The legend is still widely known and told today by artists of Kudiyattam Sanskrit theater, an art for which at least seven centuries was performed exclusively in elite temples by men and women of the hereditary matrilineal half Brahmin Kudiyattam community of Chakyars, Nambiars, and Nangyars. Widely known as the oldest continuously performed theater in the world with approximately a thousand years of continuous performance, it is now performed by a 50-50 mix of hereditary and non-hereditary artists and was recognized in 2001 as India's first UNESCO intangible heritage of humanity. And it was even the poster child of the proclamation as you see here with Amunur Madhava Chakya Suraj's Guru. As we've seen here, the legend describes an encounter between a Kudiyattam actor and British colonialist in which the actor clearly comes out on top and in the process portrays the Englishman as a fool. Folklorist Sadhana Naidani has urged scholars to take an axis jump in perceptions of colonial relations by seeking out evidence in the colonial folklore archive of folk commentary upon and criticism of colonization. As the colonial folklore archive largely represents the viewpoint and agendas of colonizer collectors, the voices of the colonized folk themselves are much more difficult to find. Naidani examines colonial period rumors that reveal a perception that the British sought to inflict murderous harm upon the population. A rumor of an Englishman hired by the British government to capture and cook young Indian boys for medicine or to collect human heads for British museums. Or rumors about the practice of census taking, of counting wells they plan to reserve for British families in impending famines or counting adults they would force into fighting their wars. As she states, quote, these tales reflect an extreme mistrust of the colonial government, its officials and its measures and their power as communication cannot be overlooked. Heeding Naidani's call, this paper considers the legend of the Englishman and the dog as a subversive narrative, one representing historical folk critique of British colonialism, but with the distinction that it is still an active oral circulation today, and therefore meanings associated with the legend, including its degree of subversion, have inevitably changed over time. I explore here the varied and conflicting layers of the legend's past and present meanings for the Kudiyattam community. I have heard and recorded several versions of this legend during my research with the Kudiyattam community since 2008. While narrators tell different versions, most note the, that the legend is part of Kotaratil Shankuni's well-known book. He's here on the left. And the book is there in the middle in the upper right. When I asked Suraj where he learned the tale, he replied that he first read it in Shankuni's collection. While the version published by Shankuni is similar to the version we see Suraj narrate, it differs in significant ways. Shankuni's virgin, version sees Parameshwara Chakyur throw a large stone instead of a mountain and identifies the other characters as 19th century King Martanda Varma of Travancore here in the bottom right, the British resident, and the Kathakali actor Ishwara Pillai Vijari Puka, which Suraj mentioned. The timeline in Shankuni's published version differs a bit as well, describing how Parameshwara Shakyar was first summoned to teach Pillai years earlier when Martanda Varma was still the crown prince, leaving the reason for his summoning at the moment of the tale itself unspecified. Shankuni also provides a few more details including that, quote, a battalion of British soldiers and other officials also stayed in and around the palace, end quote, and that the English resident's pet was a, quote, giant-sized dog that looked like a lion, end quote. He notes that the local people were petrified of the dog, but does not describe the resident and his wife enjoying their fear, as does Suraj. He also does not depict the king siding with the actor against the Englishman, as does Suraj, instead having the king simply ask the Chakir to prove his innocence before the court. 
These small but important differences indicate an undertone of resistance in Suraj's version that was either not present or was edited out for Shankuni's version, published in a period when the Kingdom of Travancore was still a princely state under the power of a British resident. So what does this legend um, mean for tellers today? So Suraj's response to my question involved a reflection on the nature of acting. He told me that although Kuriyatam acting is highly stylized, it produces a realistic effect. In this case, Kuriyatam acting is so believable that it convinces even a dog. The majority of Kuriyatam artists that I've asked this question have told me that the tale demonstrates the quote-unquote histrionic acting skills of the Chakya actor. Artists generally consider this narrative related to others that tell of the amazing acting feats of actors and actresses of yore, often telling me a number of tales in succession. To contemporary Kuriyatam artists, this legend evokes the acting feats of Kuriyatam artists of the past. To a folklorist, however, which sees uh, an underdog get the upper hand of a British official, it evokes resistance to colonial domination. When viewed in this light, what may it reveal? And here's an illustration of the legend in um, one of the newer editions of Shankuni's text. So when the Englishman hauls the actor in front of the king and accuses him of harassment, the Chakir professes his innocence and the king believes him. However, he tells the actor he must prove this to the Englishman, indicating where the real power lies. In siding with the actor, we thus see both actor and king in Suraj's version at the mercy of the British official. And when the actor chooses to enact a scene whereby he throws a large object at the colonialist, he takes a calculated risk. This symbolic act of aggression comes at a potentially high price. We thus see resistance to colonialism demonstrated by the protagonist himself in the tale. We also see undertones of resistance in the way the Englishman is characterized. He and his wife are portrayed as taking pleasure in frightening innocent bystanders with their pet. When the Englishman thinks that the Chakir has thrown a stone at his dog, even though it was obviously done in self-defense, he reacts with rage, demanding that the actor be brought before the king and punished. Embedded within this demand is the Englishman's assumption of power over local citizens and the king himself. The Englishman's unjust, unsavory character is a commentary on British colonialism and functions to make the Chakir's victory over him all the more sweet. The actor emerges as a victorious underdog in the tale. The legend concludes with the actor in a position of power over the Englishman, who in several versions is forced to apologize and admit to the actor's unparalleled powers of acting. While we hear no more of the king, we can imagine his satisfaction in seeing the smug British official brought to his knees, both literally and figuratively. When I followed up with artists to ask if the victory of the Chakir over the Englishman could be read as resistance to the British, most were unconvinced, although all found the Englishman's embarrassment humorous. In the archives of the Sangeet Natak Academy, however, the Indian National Academy for Dance, Drama, and Music, I discovered an instance where an actor reacts to the legend in a way that supports my interpretation. In a 2006 video recorded interview with Amunur Parameshwara Shakyar, the interviewer asks him about family legends. When he mentions his illustrious 19th century namesake, the interviewer comments, he sure scared that Englishman, didn't he? And they both chuckle with obvious glee. The combination of this comment with their laughter hints at an element of resistance to British authority within the tale today engendering a humorous satisfaction in turning the tables of power and making the Englishman look like a fool. While contemporary Kuriyatam artists generally fail to directly read resistance into the legend today, however, I argue that resistance was likely an easily recognizable subtext in the time of British rule. Humor is a widely employed tool of resistance, a weapon of the weak in Scots terms, against the powerful, 
and this narrative serves to take the British down a notch by having a laugh at their expense. Everyday storytelling forms like these become what Scott terms quote-unquote hidden transcripts, the depressed groups transform into a form of resistance, representing quote, a critique of power spoken behind the back of the dominant. Quote. At a time when British influence was largely resented, the main message of the tale would have been that the actor made the Englishman look like a fool. Folklorist Leela Prasad has recently introduced what she calls the audacious raconteur in colonial India, a skillful narrator who openly and, quote, audaciously challenged the ideological bul bulwark of colonialism, end quote. In his blatant insubordination against the British colonialist, the actor in our tale becomes an audacious raconteur whose nonverbal narration rejects the oppressor's belittling of his knowledge and art. While Prasad suggests an opposition between storytellers who employ, in Scott's terms, hidden transcripts, and the figure of the audacious raconteur, our case at hand evidences overlap between the two. Not only is the actor in our legend an audacious raconteur, but those who subsequently tell his story are as well. Even when told as a hidden transcript within the community, legend tellers celebrate the actor's bold insubordination and similarly reject the British devaluation of their knowledge and art. Nowadays, the main takeaway of this tale is the greatness or kemum of the Chakyar's acting. As the meaning folklore holds for communities of tellers and practitioners inevitably changes over time, it makes sense that the more subversive meanings of the tale would have faded away as British domination became an increasingly distant memory. As an interesting historical side note, while the legend of the Englishman and the dog is an example of Naidani's Axis jump, the narrative reflects a very different relationship with British colonizers than her examples do. Whereas much of the rest of India, including Northern Kerala, known as Malabar, came to be directly ruled by the British, the kingdom of Travancore, where this legend takes place, maintained a degree of sovereignty um, uh, made, uh, as a princely state directly ruled by its kings or queens, although still under the ultimate authority of a British resident. In this legend, we don't see the British portrayed as mass murderers with ultimate power over the lives and deaths of the local people, as in Naidani's examples, but instead as arrogant, callous, and demanding, conscious of their power over the king and the local population. So the deeper impression we get of the folk attitude toward the colonizers here is not one of fear, but of disdain. Today, this narrative has largely lost its subversive element, at least consciously, told instead to teach audiences that artistic feats of excellence are an important part of Kuriatam's history. Legends of the artistic prowess of Kuriatam artists of yore bring the past actively into the present through their narration. And here we have some of the oldest photographs um, of Kuriatam to date, on the upper left um, in 1908, and then the upper right um, in the 1930s. But the tales today, they forge and solidify a continuity of artistic skill within the community that touches all contemporary artists. These tales provide heroes and heroines for artists to emulate and artistic heights for artists to aspire to. For listeners, they offer counter narratives to what is widely considered the decline of the art in the 20th century, reduced to temple ritual and stripped of its artistic power. Artists use these tales today to assert that Kuriatam was not always an art in decline and that artistic excellence is central to the art's past, present, and future. In telling this tale and others like it, both hereditary and non-hereditary artists claim this history as their own while actively sustaining the community's collective history. In the process, they assert and reinforce their community membership and artistic inheritance. In each moment of their telling, the past becomes alive in the present, creating a bridge of affinity between past and present artists. Each time these tales are narrated to junior artists, the telling functions as part of their initiation into the collective memory of the community. And when told by non-hereditary artists like Suraj, 
or across caste boundaries to non-hereditary students who form the majority of, these, uh, of those learning the art today. These narratives map a past of exclusive caste performance onto a heterogeneous present and stake claims for a heterogeneous future. In so doing, non-hereditary performers like Suraj assert the tale's heroes and heroines as their own artistic ancestors, simultaneously claiming uh, their own rightful place in present day. Uriyatam. Thank you. Yeah, um, I really hope that um, uh, Leah is uh, still coming in a little bit later. So we have uh, to thank her for this uh, paper. We go on uh, with, an, uh, with the next uh, presentation from Ingrid uh, Desposito. She is a PhD student at University of Turin. Uh, and she uh, speaks, uh, uh, we, we will tell our own history, performing Afrodescent narratives in the city of Sao Paulo, Brazil. Ingrid, the floor is yours. Thank you, Elmut. I'm going to share my, my screen. Just a moment. Okay. Do you see my That's presentation? Good. Yes, we can see, uh, okay. see it. Okay, perfect. So good afternoon, everyone. It is a great pleasure to be here, even if virtually. And uh, first of all, I would like to thank you and particularly the organizers of this panel for the opportunity to share with you this important and beautiful moment. So my presentation will focus on the Bloco Afro Il Woba de Min. It is a street carnival group whose name in Yoruba means feminine hands that play drum for the King Shangu, in accordance with the free translation of the founders of the Bloco that was born in 2004 and has been active in Sao Paulo, Brazil for 17 years. Today, the group is formed by 400 black and white women and define itself as a feminine entity, working to preserve and to diffuse the black culture and to empower the women, particularly the black women in the Brazilian society through the Afrodescendant performances that is drums, rhythms, songs, dances, and corporalities of African metrics that become ways of reivindication of its African ancestry and resistance against racism and sexism. The Bloco is also based on the Candomblé, an Afro-Brazilian religion, and uh, uh, its performances are inspired by the Orishas, the Yoruba gods and goddesses, and by their ritual songs and dances. Its most important activity, even if not the only one, is the preparation of the carnival parade that happens in the city center, opening the Sao Paulo Street Carnival. It is a six month process that begins in October and ends the Friday before carnival. During this process, Every weekend, 400 women occupy different urban spaces, streets and squares, performing Afrodescendant corporal and oral narratives, as I will try to show you in this presentation. In this respect, the Iluoba de Mins parade is divided into two part, parts. The first one is dedicated to the Orishas, to their histories and the mythology while the second part is dedicated to a specific thematic that the group chooses every year. Particularly through its parade, the group represents and celebrates characters, especially female characters of the African and Afro-Brazilian history, usually not remembered and or ignored by the official Brazilian historical narratives. As an example, they celebrated the Queen Nzinga, the Angolan queen that fought against the Portuguese colonizers in the 17th century. Or they, celebra they celebrated the Akotirenes, the Quilombolas women, the women that in the colonial past 
as well as in the contemporaneity, live in the Quilombos, Maroons in English, that were communities founded during the slavery regime by runaway slaves to conquer their freedom and autonomy, and that did not disappear after the abolition of slavery, since today many of these communities still exist. By the way, the Bloco has celebrated also the history of the Brazilian Black movement, especially its female representatives in 2019, and it celebrated also the Yabaz in 2013, the female Orishas, the goddesses of the religions of African matrix that are symbols of feminine strength and alternative models of femininity. In 2020, the Blocco made its last normal uh, parade, its last normal carnival, and uh, the parade was dedicated to Lia de Itamaraca, the queen of the Siranda, an Afro-descendant music genre recognized as Brazilian immaterial cultural heritage. Finally, this year, due to the pandemic, the Blocco realized a virtual carnival projecting videos and images on the building of the city center, visually occupying the center of Sao Paulo. But what does it mean dancing, singing, and playing the drums representing these characters, narratives, and histories? What does it mean to perform such powerful narratives? At this respect, I would like to report the words of a member of the Bloco, Josie Lima, that seem to answer the above-mentioned questions. In the streets, the corporality and the orality are present. Every voice that raises in the songs and the music brings with itself the strength of our ancestors, their desires and their ways of being. What a beautiful thing to recognize my history, what is part of my essence, what composes my deepest, most honest, and most authentic me. Ilu is ancestral. Particularly attending several groups and counters, I ever began to think about what Zeca Ligero, a Brazilian author, has called the triad dance song drum, a key feature not only of the Bloco's performances, but also a fundamental characteristic of other Afro-Brazilian and Afro-descendant performances. Zeca Ligiero does affirms that, and I quote, dance song drum is not just a form. It is a strategy of venerating and telling a memory, practicing it with the whole body. In a context such as that of Sao Paulo, characterized as the whole Brazil by structural racism and sexism, the blocker's women performances thus are modes of revindicating the black presence in the urban space. From this point of view, they can be defined as corporal and oral narratives that remember and tell different memories and histories, those of the Afro-descendant population, and particularly of the black women that have been silenced along the centuries and that are absent from the majority of the official archives. Nevertheless, these memories and histories have not been forgotten by those who continue to tell them with the day home bodies, understood as fundamental places of political resistance and reivindication. According to Victoria Santa Cruz, an Afro-descendant Peruvian scholar and artist that has the find the cultural performances of the African diaspora in the Americas as a critical milieu de mémoire and the rhythm as a practice of counter memory. And in this way, she endorses the position of another scholar, Diana Taylor, that has defined the performances, dances, songs, gestures, oralities as a repertoire of incorporated knowledges, memories, and narratives that in contrast with the written documents of history archives, archives sorry, uh, and the uh, uh, are preserved and at the same time are transformed by the performers. So in this respect, according to uh, Kirsty Dorr, it can be said that, and I quote, 
By staging this memory of difference in public venues, the Blackers women put pressure upon dominant geographies of knowledge production, thereby making space in both the public sphere and the hegemonic archive for new ways of understanding the past and its relationship to the present. With this in mind, the Iluo Bademin's performances bring to the public spaces of Sao Paulo the black memory of the city, a forgotten and obscured memory. These performances that happen in several urban spaces thus make a breach of difference, a critical cut in the official memory narratives of the city, thought and instituted as homogeneous, that is, white. We will tell our own history, say the women of the Blocco. And in this respect, I would like to tell you one of the most emblematic moments during which this claim materializes. They will not silence us, the Ilu washes away the lie, is the title of the documentary of, uh, directed by Alini Sasahara, a member of the Blocco and that is dedicated to a particular performance of the Blocco Afro Ilu Oba de Min. Every year, the 13th of May, the Blocco Afro Ilu Oba de Min makes the washing of the 13th of May Street. It is a political and symbolic act by which the, women's, uh, the Blocco's women, through their Afro-descendant performances, wash away the lie of the 13th of May, since on this day in Brazil is celebrated the abolition of slavery that happened in 1888, thanks to the goodness of the Princess Isabel that signed the so-called Golden Law. These photos that I am showing are of 2018 and 2019, the last washing made by the group before the pandemic. By the way, the Iluo Bademin, along with the Brazilian Black Movement, has questioned this narrative, calling the 13th of May the day of the false abolition, since the conditions of life of the Black population did not change a lot, and the structural racism has persisted until today. But it is called the false abolition also because the abolition of slavery was not simply conceded by a good princess, since it was reached thanks to the historical struggles and resistance of the Afro-descendant population. Through their performances, thus, the Blocos women challenged the hegemonic and dominant narratives about the Afro-descendant population and the Brazilian history, constructing and bringing in the city of Sao Paulo their own corporeal and oral narratives that become ways of resistance to the silencing of the black population. Finally, I conclude with the evocative words of Joana Cortez, a member of the bloc, that explain the meaning of, the, of performing these counter-hegemonic narratives. A nation of women dressed in red will rise altogether and at the same time to fight. Our weapons, the performances, the songs and the dancing will take over every square, corner, block, neighborhood, city, country, continent, nation. We will make the crossing so that the skin of our hands could always play the drums of the world and our black opera would occupy the hearts of the living and celebrate the history of our ancestors. Thank you very much for your attention. Well, Ingrid, uh, thank you very much for your inspiring paper and also for these beautiful pictures. Uh, I re really enjoyed it. And I think it's a very important uh, aspect of narratives, uh, the empowerment and, and the challenging of, of uh, official narratives. Thank you very I look much. For forward I look forward to the discussion, but uh, before we want to, to have the next paper, our next paper is from uh, Rem Yasmin Irscheid, PhD student at King's College London uh, in Great Britain. 
Uh, the title of her paper is From Orientalism to the Fetishization of Resistance, Breaking Dominant Narratives Through Experimental Music Projects Across Germany and the MENA Region. Grim, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. And um, excuse my voice, it's still not um, recovered. So if I take a breath and yeah, um, please bear with me. So this talk is um, part of my current research um, on the socioeconomic context and discursive field in which Arab uh, German music projects are located. And um, I'm doing a practice lab uh, um, PhD. So I'm also curating an Arabic music festival in Germany and I'll draw on some of those findings. Um, in the next 15 minutes, I look at a specific branch of my project, which is the Germany-based network of experimenting musicians and curators. And I'll argue that it's necessary to locate German-Arab experimentalism within the German world music discourse, as well as considering the effective dimensions of musicianship stemming from current socio-economic working conditions for Arab musicians in Germany. So considering Mark, Mark Slobin's discussion on affinity interculture and scholarship on effective citizenship and writings on music as effective labor in the context of musicianship, um, I am to express that the social and cultural relevance of the formation, so intersections and loose networks between curators, musicians and producers I'm researching in order to challenge assumptions about Arab German music projects that stem from cultural essentialism and neo-orientalist narratives in popular and academic discourse. So broadly speaking, the musicians that I'm looking at demonstrate an avoidance with any affiliation with the German world music narratives and imagined markers of Arab identity. So a little bit of the background. So the study of contemporary Arab music is often accompanied by Eurocentric and resistance frameworks or very politically charged narratives such as those surrounding veiled women, with change, which change from sexualized imaginations and depictions of veiled women in Euro-American media texts to a very recent investment in the liberation of women post the Arab Spring since 2011. And this is promoting how Lauda Nuschen pointed out, a very particular model of liberation based on Euro-American neoliberal norms, which draws on essentialist binaries such as conservative and terrorist versus um, secular progressive youth, and also disregards the role that Europe and the US play in maintaining and supporting these regimes, and also depict the feminist struggles and patriarchal structures are being exclusive to the Middle East. So the world music paradigm um, is like, yeah, it's a part of my first chapter. Um, and in order to understand the role of narratives that shape the effective encounters between musicians of Arab um, German collectives in Germany, it's important to look at the existing structures in which um, post-world music projects and festivals operate. And in Germany, as some of you know, there have been plenty of celebratory narratives around world music. As cultural historian Andrew Hurley pointed out, this can be understood in the context of German anti-nationalist ambitions after World War II, whereby German, uh, German world music enabled musical encounters free from ideas of pure culture, race, and the rejection of German domestic folklore after 45. Indeed, there's been a world music hype since the 1960s um, involving celebratory narratives and a subsequent cosmopolitan utopia that were rooted in what Katrin Sieg described as a Wiedergutmachungsfantasy, so a fantasy of reconciliation. However, these narratives have not escaped critique for their laboratory-like conditions of intercultural encounters and a new age dogmatism that ignored the social, cultural and economic conditions of migrant musicians in Germany at the time. Other critiques, which form part of the anxious narratives around world music, were based on Gramscian thought and mentioned a disregard of the real other at the time, that is to say the musical activities of the Turkish guest workers or Gastarbeiter in Germany. Instead, selective, uh, selected others dominated stage world music festivals, projects and summit benefiting wealthy German consumers, tourists and musicians, while little progress was made in supporting migrating artists or initiating changes in cultural policy and public discourse. The way this has effective, uh, affected Arab musicianship can be still seen today in terms of the ongoing modernist search for pure and authentic expressions of cultural ethnicity, as opposed to what John Corbett call, called their tainted counterparts. And um, one example of this is the difficulty of some of my interlocutors in securing funding to organize experimental music performances that lack signifiers of a Middle Eastern imaginary. The types of Arabic music that then receive funding and media attention are often either traditional Arabic music, favored for its contribution to cultural heritage preservation, or politicized Arabic music with a radical agenda. 
However, it's always a fine line um, that artists are moving on and entirely determined by the organizers as artists also can experience, um, especially in Berlin, the censoring and cancelling of the performances in Germany when speaking out in solidarity for Palestinians, especially right now. So, yeah, um, just about the effect that that actually causes on music and uh, musician self-representation. So... Musicians who have grown up or been residing in Western Europe for a significant amount of time often engage in these discussions. They address the working conditions for non-European composers, the shortcomings in composition software, and the tokenism that Arab musicians experience with bookers or journalists who often assume that um, Arab artists like agency and judgment. This is especially important when considering that scholarly research and media reports can otherwise run, run the risk of contributing to public spaces, remaining stages that privilege white savior tropes and Middle Eastern imaginaries, which leave musicians to either operate within the German world music paradigm or develop self-exoticizing coping strategies to fit the narrow category of Arabness within the post-2011 resistance framework. And this has been voiced, for example, by the um, Palestinian Jordanian Raphael Farai, who sat in an interview with the online magazine Seen Noise, quote, To me, it's natural to talk about what's going on, but I try to not be labeled as a revolutionary artist just because I'm Palestinian of all origin. I'm not an activist. I'm a rapper. I don't consider myself a rapper that speaks of politics or revolutions, but a rapper that reflects upon what's happening to him as a person living in present circumstances. So what becomes apparent in what I just described around the world music discourse in Germany is the specific infrastructure in which musicians have to operate when it comes to funding for music projects, distribution channels, the choice of venue and self-representations of Arabness and media narratives, which all shape the effective dimension of the networks in which they are involved. So most musicians in the news, in the, sorry, <clears throat> in the loose network of Arab and German musicians that I'm researching are working together with cultural institutions across the Arab speaking world. Um, so I look specifically in Lebanon, to Lebanon and Jordan, um, to organize concerts independently from world music cultural project facilitators. In addition to this, they also run their own record labels across Berlin and the Arab speaking world, making them curators and label directors themselves. So for my project, it's therefore important to consider the fluidity among multiple roles fulfilled by my interlocutors, who are not only DJs, but at the same time curators, record label owners and audience members. And in my ethnography, I'm looking at my own role as well. So I'm German, Jordanian, Palestinian, um, also musician. So that's going to be part of the project and my ethnography as well. Um, so one example as well is the case... Um, so this is the case for one of my interlocutors I chose as an example for today, which is Rabia El Baini, which is a Lebanese DJ living in Berlin. So Rabia grew up in a village near Biblos, um, lived in Italy, then moved to Berlin. And apart from his musical activities, he's also a curator for the CTM Festival, which some of you might know, and runs his own label across Lebanon and Germany and avoids any affiliations with the world music industry. Like many other musicians of the work network I study, Rabia has good connections to main venues in the UK, Germany, France and other countries. He's very well connected, um, organizing concerts and festivals. And the way his, music's work, his music works is that he, um, when he DJs, he lays different melodies and rhythms on top of each other that often sound very conflicting and using sampling techniques that audience members can experience as, as really annoying. Um, when I ask people, they're very exhausting to dance to. And the way this plays out on the dance floor is that people will dance to the dip, to different rhythms at the same time, depending on what they feel familiar to or comfortable with, based on their musical knowledge and dance practice. Musicians like Rabia often seek out or establish new places in which experimental music distorts notions of a Middle Eastern imaginary through musical unpredictability, sampling techniques, the lack of ethnic signifiers found in past world music productions, and the sonic layering of samples from different musical traditions that chime well with uh, Mika Bal's concept of migratory aesthetics. Mika Bal describes how migratory movement becomes visible through mediums of movement itself, such as film, because he comes from visual, visual art, or here in my case, compositional practice and embodied movement through dance. Her notion of movement, as well as her extension of Rancière's notion of misentente or productive disagreement, offer a helpful framework for the sensorial and aesthetic dimensions of complex sonic layering and interpersonal dynamics in post-world music uh, productions. To conclude, so the premise of my talk was to consider how Germany as a field site and space of post-world music experimentalism can offer a richer picture of diasporic music making and cultural production in European urban centers. 
especially in the German context with a long-standing history of world music festivals, degree programs and distribution channels, Arab musicianship and work subjectivities in Berlin do not only reflect, but are constructed around the material and socioeconomic conditions of music production and consumption that plays a major role in the way musicians within those networks connect and interact in their musical and extra musical work. Looking at the intersection of effective encounters between Arab and German musicians and the world music paradigm in Germany, my research aims to recognize the social and cultural relevance of effective dimensions and everyday interactions between music practitioners, curators, publics, and policymakers that shape discourses around Arab identity in Germany and local cultural policy, which in turn feed back into musicianship. In this way, I argue that there are existing often anxious sentiments regarding the world music context in which post-migrant networks are situated, but would like to emphasize the generative capacity of these post-world music settings and platforms in terms of disrupting discourse and engendering new narratives. Thank you very much. Well, uh, thank you very much, Rim, for your inspiring paper. Uh, it's, it's a very important uh, topic. Um, and uh, especially I, this, this aspect of music as, as a means for establishing uh, counter narratives, I think um, um, it's, it's, uh, it's um, uh, a red thread we, we should follow uh, further also in the, in the working group. Thank you very much. Thank you. So um, we are good in time, uh, perfect. Uh, now the next paper is, um, uh, I may introduce Maria Caliambo. She's a senior lecturer at uh, Yale University, United States. Today we are, have really have a, a travel around the world. And the uh, title of her paper is Descendants of the Great Nation, Broken Historical Narratives uh, for Greek American Children. Maria, the floor is yours. Good afternoon. Thank you so much, uh, Helmut. Uh, can you hear me well? Yes, yes. It is a great pleasure to be with you and thank you, Helmut and Peter, for organizing these panels. It's uh, really wonderful and to share with you my thoughts and my new project. Let me share some uh, pictures. Okay, here we are. Um, it's uh, so nice that with these panels today, we traveled all over the world, India, Europe, Brazil. So now let's go to America and let's see how Greeks in America behave. So my new research project refers to the book culture of Greek Americans. The first immigrants arrived at the United States at the end of the 19th century, trying to escape the dire financial circumstances at home. Immediately after their arrival, Greek American publishing houses appeared in urban centers such as New York, Boston, Chicago. There was a considerable production and circulation of books for the immigrants, books for adults, for children, literature books, religious books, popular books, and so on and so on. So today, I will focus on one part of this big book production. I will focus on school books for Greek American children. In particular, my paper will discuss the complicated mediation of historical narratives in those pedagogical books. Based on the first Greek American school books published in the 1930s, I will demonstrate that Greek history is taught through broken and selective narratives. And I will answer following questions. Which periods of the long Greek history are included in the school books and why particularly those? And what norms and values follow these historical narratives which aimed to educate young children in America? So before, let me give you uh, some information regarding the education for the immigrant children in America, the Greek education. So the first Greek schools were established at the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, the first one, as we know, is 1904 in uh, Chicago, named uh, Socrates. The majority of the educational books for the Greek schools in America were imported from Greece. However, 
these imported books did not reflect the realities of the new home in America. They were not suitable, both in terms of pedagogy, but also in aesthetics. When the children saw them, they wanted to throw them out of the window, as we have some um, archival records from um, uh, school uh, uh, reports. So in order to address these problems, several educators in America emphasized the necessity to produce their own books. So only in the 1930s were the first school books for Greek American children written and published in America. So until then, they were only imported from Greece. So in the 30s, we have the first books and the first one that you saw on the title page in the previous slide. So these books were mostly readers and primers for the elementary schools. So teaching Greek history is of paramount importance to the education of Greek Americans. I quote, whichever Greek child doesn't know history, doesn't know his origin. Declares, uh, these are the words of a patriotic teacher to his uh, students of elementary school. And these are included in one book that I will show you later. However, the texts in the school books selectively concentrate on two periods of the Greek history. First, the ancient classical past of the 4th and 5th century BC. And second, they concentrate on the Greek Revolution, the Greek War of Independence in 1821. So these two time frames, the ancient uh, past and the Greek Revolution, offer a variety of successful, heroic moments necessary for the formation of identity and strengthening of the pride of the new generation. Let's start with the um, ancient past. Let's see some examples. So in 1935, the first Greek American anthology with poems and theater dialogues for the school festivals was published in New York. This publication, which you see on the screen, belongs to the first attempts by Greeks in America to produce their own school books for their children in America. Besides its place in Greek American school books history, the anthology is important because it demonstrates the efforts of the first generation of Greek educators regarding transmitting their heritage to their children. And as you see already from the title page, I wanted to start with this image. The title page is a reminiscence of ancient classical art, a usual tactic in the books by Greek Americans at that period. The same was also if you had seen in the book that I had on my title slide. It depicts, as you see this uh, uh, title page, it depicts the front entrance of an ancient temple, temple with Doric columns on both sides and a meander mo motif on the frieze. And all these are common stylistic elements demonstrating the love to the ancient art. The layout of this title page is clever and designed and, uh, and as you see, the name of the author is, has been put on top uh, on the pediment and the title of, of the book is uh, being printed between the two Doric columns. The anthology also includes further images of ancient Greek art. So now let's see some texts of that uh, book. There is a dialogue uh, with the title, The Greek School in America, where the teacher performs a history lesson in the school. And how is that history lesson? It starts with the students singing a folk song. And the teacher, impressed by the singing performance, encourages the children by saying, I quote, with such Greek kids, the Greek spirit will never be erased. Then the teacher tests the students on glorious moments of ancient Greek history, such as battles of Marathon, Thermopylae, Salamina, Plataeus. So these are famous battles where Greeks won the Persians or lost by treason, as in the famous battles with Leonidas, Leonidas in Thermopylae. The teacher and the students agree that ancient Greek history is important for the education in American schools as well. 
where they also learned, for instance, about marathon. The kids who go to American schools, they had also the experience of talking about the marathon and the sport that derived from that uh, name and that uh, uh, battle. I quote, the immortal Greek history is being studied by the whole world, as the teacher says in the, that theater, in that dialogue. At the end of that history lesson, there is a very, in a very performative manner, the teacher asks the children if they will forget Greece. And all answer, and all kids answer, never, no, we will never forget Greece. And the teacher invites the kids to love Greece as this, the same as they love America. I quote, I am sure that you will never forget, forget your Greek origin, end of quote. So these performative questions at the end of the history lesson um, between the teacher and the students testify the commitment to Greece and Greek culture. And they, move, they were moving moments and the mother who was following the lesson, she takes it. I call takes her handkerchief and wipes her eyes. So the author with this scene succeeds to create sentimental reactions to the audience and the readers of the anthology. History is here being performed and has to be intensively felt, even crying. So because time flies, I'm moving to the next um, um, historical moment, namely the battle, the, the Greek War of Independence which happened, the Greek Revolution in 1821. And let me uh, take the opportunity and mention to all of you now that uh, this year, 2021, marks the bicentennial of the Greek uh, state, the bicentennial of the Greek Revolution. And you may have heard how big uh, uh, several ceremonies are throughout Greece and throughout the world in diaspora um, celebrating this big uh, landmark of Greek history. So here I show you an image, I wanted to start with aesthetic first, an image of one of, of another reader for elementary school. This was published in 1935. And you see here um, a child dressed um, as a, a dressed with a, a folk costume as a soldier. Um, the image, the image accompanies the letter E, Epsilon, which is the letter for a Greek child, Elinopoulou. And you see a young boy dressed in a folk soldier's costume, as Tsolias, as we say. And the text here reads, the Greek child is full of braveness, demonstrating the proudness of being Greek. The image, this image, this picture here refers to the heroic deeds, the battles, the legendary deaths of the heroes of the revolution. This is the national costume still in Greece, which was inspired by those years of the revolution. Um, oops, before that, yes. The, I will mention another one more example uh, very briefly. The resurrection of Greece is a theater play in three acts in the same school book for festivals, which offers a brief history of uh, the beginning of the revolution. And the act starts very dramatically with the mother Greece imprisoned in chains and dressed in black um, garments. The mother of democracy, Greece, is a slave. And this was something incompatible for the European and American Philhellenic spirit. So the play, the theater play for the children, uh, continues with truth, faith, and other personified women who, who are offering support to the enslaved Greece. Then the a, a bishop, uh, Germanos, who blessed the beginning of the revolution, encourages and supports young men to start the revolutionary fight against the Ottomans. And the captain of the Greek fighters offers the following oath in front of the Greek flag, I quote, we swear, O oh, our sweet flag, to fight for freedom. We swear to the holy bones of our great ancestors that you, Greece, will be resurrected. So this is included in the anthology of the poems for children. And the play concludes with the personification of Greek regions who were not free by then and they wanted to be included and connected with the rest of Greece. So I move on with my conclusions, my preliminary conclusions of this short talk. History has always been central to Greek education, particularly in the diaspora. 
Greek immigrants pay special attention to the historical awareness of their children. My short paper focused on the complicated mediation of historical narratives among Greeks in America. Based on Greek American school books, I demonstrated that history is taught through broken and segmented narratives which aim to indoctrinate children and create strong ethnic identities. Interestingly, only two periods of the whole Greek history are included in these narratives, namely the classical antiquity, 5th and 4th century BC, and the Greek revolution against the Ottoman occupation, 1821 until 1830. All these stories oscillate between history and mythology. Their leitmotif is the self-sacrifice of Greek heroes. These broken histories contributed to creating strong ethnic identities in the diaspora. The conscious selection of these segmented historical narratives demonstrates the wish to mediate a glorious past. Moreover, it emphasizes the continuity from antiquity and the national struggles to success. Additionally, narratives about antiquity or the revolution come in the form of short theatrical dialogues to be used in school performances. Their performative character contributes to the formation of the historical awareness of the Greek children. Finally, these broken narratives of an appropriated history aim to indoctrinate the children to praise their heritage and imitate their ancestors. Young Greek Americans should love their first home, Greece, and be proud of the heroic deeds of their ancestors who died like martyrs. This fragmentary history mirrors the widespread strategy by Greek Americans to include those specific historical narratives that support their ethnic identity. According to Yorgos Anagnostou, Greeks in America make selective choices of usable pasts in order to support the coherence of the community and the resilient keeping of year-long traditions and memories. And I finish with a poem which is printed in this school of book for festivals where Mother, Greeks, Mother Greece talks to her children, to the Greek children in America and asks them to come back. Hail Greek children, my children, far from your mother, you American kids who live in the foreign lands. I'm waiting for you, your homeland, the land of Demosthenes, oh children of America, descendants of the great nation. Come to me, to know me, I will get to know you too. You will kiss me sweet and I will kiss you sweet too. Oh yes, I will embrace you with happiness in my arms. You are my new generation, my children of the foreign lands. These are the history. This is the history for the descendants of the great nation, the children of the foreign lands. Thank you so much. Yes, and uh, thank you, Mar Maria, for this uh, uh, paper, which opens up really uh, a lot of uh, connections and, and ideas. Um, it's a very important um, uh, approach. Also, um, one of my associations have been made from the pop culture, from popular films. I, uh, I've been thinking to this film, My Big Fat Greek Wedding, <laughs> Probably you know it yes. <laughs> because yeah. this really sh shows these uh, ambivalences and curiosity and, 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 and strange things happens with this nationalistic um, construction of history. <laughs> Indeed, thank okay, you. Yes. <laughs> so uh, we are coming to uh, our last paper. Um, um, I may introduce Mamta Sachan Kumar. She's a PhD student at the Australian National University, Australia, at the moment uh, speaking from Singapore, as I remember right. And uh, right. the paper, um, uh, the title of the paper is Breaking the Silence, a Storytelling of Women's Self-Dismissal by Reading into Nothing. Mamta, the floor is yours. Thank you, Helmut. Um, just a check if everyone can hear me clearly. Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. My name is Mamta, and I am an early stage PhD candidate at the Australian National University. Unfortunately, as I was sharing with Helmut earlier, 
Due to COVID-19 restrictions, I have had to begin my course remotely from my home country, Singapore, where I am at the moment. And it's just about hitting 10.30 at night this side. Uh, but I'm very grateful for this opportunity, especially as a distance learner, to engage such a diverse European network of scholars and fascinating topics, which I wouldn't typically encounter in local academic circuits within Asia. So with that, I will share my screen. Could I just check if my screen can be seen? Yes, um, we, can, we can see it. Thank you. Tonight, I share with you the beginnings of a project that has emerged in the course of my PhD research. As you can see on the slide, this project is titled Breaking the Silence, a Storytelling of Women's Self-Dismissal by Reading into Nothing. To give you some background, my PhD research gathers stories of women across generations in Japan's Sindhi merchant diaspora in order to explore the roles that they play in the community. My research is deeply personal because this is the community of my childhood and is a topic that I have been committed to for the past 14 years since embarking on my master's thesis where I had documented the history of Sindhi merchant settlement in Japan. In case you aren't familiar, Sindhi merchants are historically a community of traders from Sindh, which is the province in Pakistan. Here to the right is a map to give you a gauge of where Sindh is. The merchants are almost exclusively a network of men engaged in trade across outposts in several cities, including the port cities of Yokohama and Kobe in Japan. This community specifically is mainly Hindu by religion, and as a result, was displaced during the war that created an Islamic Pakistan. As you can see from the map, the province of Sindh is in close proximity to border territory between India and Pakistan. In the aftermath of the partition, Sindhi merchant families lost their homeland and fled across borders to safety, over time dispersing as they relocated to the many established business bases into familial diasporas. This explains their settlement in Japan. Even though the Sindhi diaspora has a global presence and strong networks that could be studied, there isn't an extensive repository of research findings about them. Within existing scholarship, the focus has tended to be on the context of war, particularly on the trauma and resilience of Hindu Sindhis surviving partition. Where publications account for Sindhi trade history, women are doubly marginalized for the details are devoted to the acumen and prowess of the shrewd Sindhi businessmen, with negligible mention of the matriarch whose partnership in holding down the fort back home was critical to sustain the seafaring ventures of her husband. And in case study narratives of specific communities, women are at best relegated to the periphery in supporting roles, framed in silos as chapters on culture, rather than substantially entwined to inform a more comprehensive narrative as a whole. My thesis aims to narrow this gap in the literature by positioning women in this diaspora as the narrative center, not to compete with nor complete the male merchant's narrative, but to discover yet another narrative of its own accord that interlinks with and builds on the budding collective of works about the Sindhi diaspora. It is also my hope to situate my work at the broader intersection of gender, body, and space through micro-scale analysis of movements in the mundane, everyday activities of these women. To gather a preliminary round of data, I had interviewed some of these women of the middle generation five years ago. 
so the daughters or daughters-in-law of the pioneer settlers or women within this generation, like my mother, who arrived in Japan by way of marriage in the 1970s. A majority of these women were and remain primarily homemakers. They belong to a relatively affluent merchant class of foreign residents in upscale neighborhoods in their respective residences in Japan. One of the first interviews I had conducted was with my mother. What follows on the next slide is an excerpt of my abstract for this conference, which unveils the motivation for this particular project on breaking the silence. My frustration was painfully more obvious than the substance of my mother's contribution when, in wrapping my interview with her, I had asked, so what did you do all day, Mama? I was gathering data for my project on women's stories in our community, beginning with my most accessible informant, only to find myself thoroughly annoyed by my mother's apparent lack of self-awareness. I first got a baffled stare back, almost as if she had found my question absurd. Then she trumped it by summing up a solid hour's recount of her early married life as a lonesome gaijin housewife in Japan in one word, nothing. I followed faithfully by gawking in turn, day in, day out, for days on end. To my mother, she had spent her days doing nothing. This was what was absurd, this illogical sequence of rich detail followed by total negation. To my mother, however, that was just how it was, for this is how it has always been. This episode was the trigger for this project, which aims now to analyze this response of nothing and glean deeper insight not only on what nothing could mean, but how it might have broader implications beyond the case of a single personal exchange between mother informant and daughter researcher. Now, there are at least a couple of assumptions in my excerpt that have since unraveled as I have reflected on the interview over time and attempted to research on women and self-dismissal and more generally on literature to do with gender and discourse analysis, particularly on silence as a communicative feature. I have to the right of the slide included the same excerpt with the parts in concern highlighted in a different colored font for your reference. I take these assumptions as drivers towards a reading into nothing and hereafter seek a theorizing of nothing. First, I presupposed that my mother, by being my mother, was accessible. What I didn't anticipate was the roadblock that I would hit with her response of nothing. It did not occur to me immediately that the seemingly frustrating response was actually an insightful starting point for me to dig deeper. It only became more apparent when nothing featured variously in interviews with other women and became more clearly a pattern of self-dismissal. The many adjustments these women had to make when they first arrived in Japan, a radically different environment, culture, and the language barrier, on top of the isolation they felt before forming friendships, were trivialized. Humor, used as a coping mechanism, was at the same time a revelation of the women's hardships in their new lives as housewives in alien country, where they too were perceived as aliens by the Japanese. There were women who kept mum about the trauma that they, as young girls, or their mothers had had to endure while separated from their husbands in the wake of the partition, before they could migrate and join their spouses in Japan. For some, this period of separation wasn't a matter of days or weeks or even months. It lasted as long as a decade or even more, that their struggles of adjustment was a common experience, one that reified their solidarity with each other, no doubt, also became grounds for normalizing, or in other words, reducing the enormity of their difficulties. To the women, 
struggling wasn't unique, so it wasn't worthy of recognition. Second is my assumption that my mother lacked self-awareness. Her response of nothing followed a lengthy sharing of her early days as a new Indian bride left most days to her own devices in a shoebox apartment partitioned by a wall that separated my father's workspace. She was unable to converse in Japanese and unwilling to venture out into the cold, busy streets of business as usual Osaka for fear that she would get lost and not know how to find her way back home. How she persevered through such circumstances and rendered it all nothing was incomprehensible to me as much as it was commonsensical to her. And here in this disconnect lies the insight. We were approaching the same matter from starkly different vantage points, a consideration that tends to get even more blurry when conducting research on one's own community where much is taken for granted. My mother's response of nothing was reflective of her gendered conditioning and a perspective prevalent as it quickly came to be known to me across many women of her generation. There wasn't as such a lack of self-awareness then, as much as that was her awareness. She had had the ability to recollect her experiences by listing out her many chores and ways of busying herself for the day. But when asked what she did, in other words, what they amounted to, that entire list came to naught. As meat or as substance of contribution, they accounted for nothing. Taking the lead from my assumptions, I am now in the process of theorizing nothing as holding a multiplicity of possible meanings. Some interpretations include habit or communicative style as the only known codes available to women of my mother's generation to transmit their sense-making of their lives and roles as housewives. Boredom with respect to the mundanity of women's worlds or refrain as a means to suppress or silence the actuality of their hardships for a variety of reasons. It could be, for instance, that it is inappropriate conventionally or culturally to complain, or that they wish to not resurrect a matter of the past. Which brings me to the point that the notion of silence can't be taken strictly as agentless, non-expression. Rather, Silence could also be taken as voice and a choice exercised by the women in their management of a conversation. In this regard, reading into nothing has opened me up to the world of sociolinguistics and gender discourse analysis, where inferring from the social context of conversing about daily activities, nothing isn't a blockade, but a reassertion of the ages old gender division of labor. It has deeper implications in connecting to the private, unrecognized domain of women's work, which is rendered insignificant even by women themselves. And in rendering so, makes a project such as Breaking the Silence both challenging and necessary to pursue. On this note, I thank you for your attention and look forward to receiving your feedback and advice on pushing my project further. Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you, Mamta, for, for this uh, inspirational uh, paper. And uh, I really like your, your, your coping with this nothing and how you, you you showed uh, behind this nothing, there is really a lot of things. And uh, yes, no, nothing is uh, maybe some, uh, especially in, in, in narrative research, a very important uh, path to follow. Uh, and not, not always to the something, um, but also to the seamless nothing. Okay, uh, we are through with the papers. Um, and I, I've got to admit, I'm a little bit uh, overwhelmed with all these uh, information, ideas, connections, and and links and possible links. Um, um, I would like to to open the discussion. Uh, please, 
again we use the chat or the the hand sign uh, for for the discussion okay maria you are the first <laughs> yes <laughs> thank you it was really very rich panel and as you said we moved around from one corner to another very nice uh, let me start with one question for ingrid let's go to brazil yeah ingrid thank you so much i mm -hmm. liked your paper um i have um, um i was intrigued by the fact that these women wanted to uh, honor their ancestors and they feel that they belong this belonging etc cetera, etc cetera. so i was wondering how the white women um refer to that how do they connect with that because there was a group you said of black women and a few white how do the white can uh, perceive uh, this connection to heritage yeah thank you I can answer now or uh, we will answer? Mm -hmm. okay. Yes, sure. Okay, thank you. Uh, discussion now is open to everything. <laughs> okay, thank you very much, Maria, for the question. It's a uh, hot point <laughs> of, my, of my research. And uh, actually one of the uh, explanation is that uh, how uh, the black women, but also the white women said, that racism is not just a why a black uh, question. It's a question that uh, all people need to uh, need to need to how to say to address to address. So um, the question of the uh, ancestry, the African ancestry, is lived as a way to celebrate this other history also by the white uh, the white women so to celebrate this uh, other history this black history and uh, as a way to uh, fight against the racism to be um, to be how to say uh, to be hand in hand with the black women and uh, to try to uh, to stop the silencing of this other history so it's a uh, it's a uh, it's lived as a a political act, a political act and a political positioning uh, against uh, racism and the silencing of the black history. So they are not they are not celebrating their ancestors, even if the black people of Brazil constructed the nation. So in uh, in some um, we can say that they are the ancestors of all Brazilians. So it's uh, this is the positioning of the, the white women so thank you i hope to to answer your your question mm -hmm. Brigitte? thank you very much all of you it was such a great panel i really enjoyed it i have a question for you maria um, I, I, I was just thinking the same as Helmut with my big fat Greek wedding. So what about today? Is there still a market for school books for Greek children? Are they focusing on the same two historical periods or, or, or is there any change you, you can observe? Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Brigitte. It is painful to, for me to say yes. Unfortunately, yes. So now we're talking about the Greek children in America, right? The diaspora kids. Yes, um, Greece is uh, Socrates and Plato and, and democracy, the birth of democracy. This is a big narrative. Uh, of course, ancient past. And then... Uh, the revolution, because the revolution is the birth of the new country, is the birth of modern Greece, 1821. And the revolution was a difficult revolution. It uh, lasted for 10 years. The European and American support had to help and succeed. Otherwise, it would have uh, failed. And also, it's full of uh, myths and legendary heroes which we learn, I learned, and still we learn in the school. And I'm afraid, yes, these are the big historical narratives, ancient past and then the revolution, the 19th century. 
very rarely now in some books in modern in in America now they learn about the Second World War, but not as much of the Greek, uh, you know, the Greek um, role of that. But in general, about they they learn about this, you know, in their history lessons uh, in America in general. So it is really very fragmentary historical knowledge. It is very selected, and as, as my colleague Anagnosto writes, usable pasts. They want to take those historical moments that fit the narrative of the success, of the struggle and success. Mm-hmm. I, I am sorry to say, yes, it is the, pr- yeah, I would love to see different. And, you know, I'm from Thessaloniki, from North Greece, and Thessaloniki was not free in 1821. It was almost 100 years later. And they don't learn that Mm -hmm. if they do very, you know, very marginal. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. The next is uh, Michael. Yes, I've, I've just uh, just one comment uh, to Manta. I also liked your paper very much. Thank thank you very much. Thank just you. a short comment. I think uh, many of us learned in our courses uh, don't do interviews with our parents because you know there are very complex effects and taboos working. And you told us you started with your mom. And you cr- crashed into this nothing. And what you did with that is really great. This is a, a very good example. I think you will do interview with other women. But for me, it was, was great to see what you can do in an <laughs> effective way, in, 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 in a really a breaking the rule way of doing interviews. This is just my comment. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, well, I suppose it's appropriate for a breaking the rules conference theme. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I have to. I have to admit that when I first uh, came across the nothing um, response, it was it was a sort of a roadblock for me or a barrier that that led to a lot of frustration. Before I sort of had to sit down with a mentor of mine, uh, a professor that I had worked with previously. And she and she had encouraged me to revisit the nothing and and sort of try to understand where this nothing is coming from. So I think that became then uh, sort of an unraveling of its own nature and has developed into into this project. But thank you for acknowledging that. <laughs> okay. Are there further questions? Well, yes, Claudia. Yeah, I maybe have a question for Wim, um, but I'm <laughs> I'm thinking through it. So um, you talked about the structural um, uh, yeah, uh, constructions behind uh, the Arab music const- uh, uh, production in Germany. But there are also these narratives that are really uh, now there because they are they have stories to tell. So, do you also want to um, research on the narratives in the in the song texts and um, through these things, or are you more interested in the structural uh, question? Thanks for your question. Um, yeah, that's something I think because I'm in my first year, tried to sort of touch on various aspects and then do the thing of like in my fourth year, narrowing it down to whatever is um, interesting. It depends I'm because I'm in a music department. Um, they're not too keen for me to write about media text and media communication studies, but I am um, in some ways. The interesting bit with the musicians I'm looking at is that they try to distort them. So that's the thing. A lot of people don't want to talk about them because not because they're from, they're not Syrian refugees. They're very like middle-class um, Lebanese citizens. Um, they don't have very different stories to like stories of me growing up in Berlin. And most of them try to sort of distort the fo- or like put the focus on their music as something that um, is quite universal. So most of the musicians um, that would have samples from Indonesia, from, I don't know, British um, music, French music. So they try to sort of distort that focus because um, the musicians I spoke to say, well, we spoke about sort of homemaking and nostalgia for too long. We want to do a very forward focusing. Um, we want to sort of, yeah, 
look at it in a more forward facing way and um, they want to talk about their time in Berlin so yeah I try to obviously see that really critical and also look at their own narratives but um, yeah it's yeah if that answers to your questions they try to do the exact opposite with their music which is something I think is really interesting okay Okay, uh, more questions at the moment. Yes, uh, Theo. I got to unmute myself. Yes, um, a, a question for Maria. Just curious, uh, you quoted this poem at the end uh, of your uh, presentation, and it's part of this uh, Greek book. And it, it says something like, um, I'm Mother Greece, come back to me, I'll kiss you, you kiss me. Does this mean that these children, uh, their parents went to America for a reason, of course, and they probably weren't um, thinking of returning uh, for good, at least. Um, how about, are these children really being encouraged to remigrate to back to Greece or just to visit and and uh, have the feeling of uh, being in uh, in well uh, native thank country. Thank you, thank you, Theo. Yes, this was one point that I cut it out of um, time constraints. Um, the return. I think those school books from the first generation in the 1930s, they mirror the feelings of the parents because the parents write those books and they clearly, clearly speak about return, return to the motherland mm. and come back to me. Uh, they compare mother is um, Greece and the daughter is America. And there is always a comparison between mother and daughter and mother is always better. And we can celebrate better Christmas in Mother Greece, better Easter, we can do this, we can do that. And there are some stories in those books that clearly say, oh, the nostalgia, I want to take a boat and go back and see my friends, my family, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So and I think it mirrors the wish of the parents, authors of those books, to go back to Greece. This is clearly a return motif, the return narrative uh, within those school books. Now, if they return or not, they do go, they do visit the kids, they do visit their parents, uh, their families over the summer for longer periods. Yeah. Um, and they do narrate about how nice it was when we visited our families. But... Um, if they aim to go back, yes, the parents do want to go back. The children, though, it's a different generation. It's, it changes. They do not. Okay. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, at the moment, uh, no, no questions. Then I, I want to, to, to go a little bit on thin ice. Um, <laughs> Because I, I want to ask between um, Ingrid's and Maria's um, presentation, I, I, I think there are a very uh, a lot of differences, and it's totally different stories. But in in both cases, um, it, it is it is about on constructing identities, constructing nation, constructing imagined communities, and heritage. And, um, and heritage, and yes. and in, in in both ca cases, I see uh, it's 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 a kind of selection. What um, what want uh, to pick I out uh, of the of, of my history of my heritage, and what I, I try to connect it to a, to a new com community. I know it's 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 very th thin ice because um, uh, on the one hand uh, it's it's uh, migration on the other hand. Uh, Behind lies um, slavery and racism, um, but m maybe m maybe it's it, it's it's worthwhile to think about um, how narratives are, are used to create these new narratives, and uh, especially I've, I found it interesting in in, in your paper, uh, Ingrid, when, when you said there are also white uh, women. So th this narrative uh, can be appropriated. Uh, I, I think you 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 use the term too, and so um, um, the, these narratives become uh, powerful. 
Um, on the other hand, M Maria, I'm asking um, which kind of um, empowerment um, you you can see in uh, with the uh, Greek uh, migrants. I, I answer first, or you can go, Maria, if you want. No, no, please do. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yes, it's. I think that uh, we can say that what we are talking about uh, in both cases is uh, also what Maria said. It's a, a, a performative history. It's a, a performative character of the history. So uh, deciding uh, to select to select parts of history it's obviously yeah. a way of uh, uh, try to construct another history and uh, to construct this history performative in, in a performative way to create uh, another sense of uh, of belonging a sense of belonging that has been uh, broken uh, that has been broken that has been silenced that has been ignored and so I think that uh, this performative character of the, of the history and of the narrative, the historical narrative, it's very present in both. And um, it's when you, say, when, when, when you say that the white women are appropriating a history, I'm not so sure that it's a way of, of appropriating an history. I think uh, that uh, is more a way of, as I said before, a way of uh, uh, of be um, to, a way to act politically. So because they didn't, mm. uh, they don't say they didn't say that uh, this, this is their history. You know, it's it's quite different. Black women say uh, say this is our history. White women didn't, uh, or they said it's our history but they are not appropriating it's our history it's the history of our nation of that part of a nation that has been ignored so i i, I think that there isn't uh, uh, or not it's not so strong the uh, the process of appropriation maybe someone appropriates appropriates uh, history but uh, i i think that uh, it's more uh, um, it's quite different it's not so a strong appropriation it's more a celebrating a celebration of, a, of this history thank you mm -hmm. um, i like very much uh, this performance aspect and as i mentioned to, to my material yes these were theaters so to be performed in the schools and also ingrid has this performative aspect clearly when they dance and sing mm. I think the different. I think that Ingrid and mine talks are the two coins, the, the two sides of the same coin. The two sides, because I see Ingrid's um, per, it's performance of the ignored history, whereas mine is performance of the dominant history. So my mm -hmm. historical broken historical narratives are the dominant, the powerful, uh, the um, heroic, mythic the very uh, um, uh, to be proud of and i'm wondering where is the rest of the history we all know there is much more than that and why mm -hmm. they do narrate as they want the greek history so it is the performance of the dominant narrative in my scenario and this has to do with education because i used this is used for schools the kids has have to learn this particular history so that they are proud Greeks and become perfect Greek Americans. So in Ingrid, it's the other side, it's performance of the silent history, that the one that is not uh, in the dominant paradigm, but the one that it is more marginalized, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I agree completely with this, your analysis. I, and, and I think performance is very important, how performance really plays a role to the storytelling, to the narrative uh, experience as such, that we do experience uh -huh. history and we learn it uh, through this uh, theater or th through these processions uh, or what uh, or songs or what else. So it's uh -huh. more, more intense and more learned. So at the end, the woman cries. I, I read something that she hears, mm -hmm. she sees this performance and she wipes her eyes. Oh, how proud I am. And, 
and moved I mm-hmm. am. So I think performance, storytelling, and broken narratives, these are a good combination to build the bigger narrative. Mm-hmm. Yes, this is a very important aspect, whereas the rest of the history, and this links to, to Momta, um, this is also the, the question, where is the rest of the narrative? Where's the, um, the, the missing, uh, the, the, the unspoken, and, and, and so on? Um, I see in the chat uh, there's, um, uh, there are two comments to Mamta. I hope you see uh, them. Uh, from uh, also Lund- Lundström yes. and Claudia Wilms. Ah, yes, and I'm just uh, uh, responding. Okay, perfect. Ah, yeah, okay. Perfect. Uh, this, uh, this is the best outcome of a conference to link ideas and, uh, and uh, research. Are there any more questions or comments? At the moment, we have two minutes left, but I don't want to, to stretch the panel too long. I think you all are tired and maybe also overwhelmed with ideas and, and connections. So if the, there are no further questions, then I, I want to speak some uh, <laughs> concluding notes. Um, It's just um, a lot of aspects um, has, has been uh, touched. Um, we um, thought about narratives and identity community, about the market of narratives uh, too, um, about the myth uh, on, of uh, storytelling. And uh, I think a kind of storytelling uh, has come back uh, again um, with this performance of narratives. Um, I think we can we can read this as a, a kind of uh, a storytelling tool. Um, we have spoken about narratives and empowerment, uh, especially in the in the second session. This has been a very important uh, aspect on constructing her- histories and uh, narratives. And I also can ask uh, these new um, uh, n- uh, narratives. Um, uh, Ingrid and Ma- Maria sp- uh, spoke about maybe um, in which time have we, have we to break them again? So uh, this is um, a kind of transitional character of narratives, um, uh, also the, the performative aspect. Um, we have uh, spoken about uh, the construction of common history um, of disturbing na- narratives um, and also the transgression of borders. And... Uh, Just when, when writing down this, I, I realized uh, this transgression of borders. This uh, the best example now has been uh, this uh, panel and, and 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 the speakers um, who come. We we really uh, broke the the borders uh, of uh, of nations and uh, Europe. So um, yes, um, this is very valuable, and uh, this takes me to the point what. What is uh, the idea of this working group? Um, and I'm really glad that this has been the first panel of the um, approved um, working group. I'm, I'm really um, glad we had uh, such um, such a f- f- fantastic outcome and, and uh, um, really transgressing also our ideas on, on, on narratives. So the last thing uh, to do for me is um, To thank everybody, all all who participated in this uh, session, I, I want to thank for your ideas, your comments, your um, discussions. I want to thank the board um, uh, and um, Petra for organizing this um, panel, um, for selecting the, the papers um, for our discussions we had. So a great thank. But most of all, I want to thank all of the speakers with your ideas, um, with your input. Um, and um, I really hope um, we can stay in touch. Um, I will s- s- send uh, later an email around and um, maybe we can exchange uh, the presentations if you if you want to. But uh, also, um, I think 
we should use this uh, working group on narrative cultures to um, uh, uh, furthermore in, in, in future um, exchange our ideas um, and I, I think um, there we have a great future. Okay, thank you all. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you so thank much. You. Very much. Much. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. I hope to, to, to see you face to face soon. <laughs> yes, thank you. Uh, may uh, I, um, how can I how can I join the group uh, of narrative culture? I uh, just uh, sent an, an uh, email to me. Okay. Um, I, I, I think it, it should be in, in, in the system. Or, or you go on, on, on the CF website, to yeah. the working groups, and to Narrative Cultures, and, and there's uh, the email um, for the working group. All right. Thank you so much. <laughs> there's a link in the chat. For this. Thank you. I will do this. You're thing. welcome. Perfect. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, I was also actually Thank you. going to ask the same question. So it's great to hear that uh, it's still a, a possible to participate, even though I unfortunately missed the Sunday's meeting. So that's a good news as well. It's no problem. <laughs> you, every time you are welcome. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> yes, and, and thank you for organizing this panel. It has been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Yeah. Okay. Bye -bye. Have a nice bye -bye. Bye -bye. Have a good time. Bye. Bye. Bye.